Hey, what's up, everybody? Pastor John John here, hanging out once again at the Church Cove. And uh, it's just a homey little spot. And um, more than just kicking it right here, I'm excited for you all kicking it right there where you're at in your life group. And uh, I've been hearing some awesome reports of just folks getting together, chopping it up, hanging out, eating some good food, and just growing in their faith. And that's what this is all about. So hopefully today you'll be encouraged. And uh, what I did a few weeks back is I asked people to send me some ideas, some questions. What are some things that you want to hear about or talk about, perhaps learn about? And what does the Bible have to say about these specific topics? And uh, among several questions that came our way, one of which was very interesting and it tied in with this other question that came in was, the question was, uh, should a Christian strive to be rich? Should a Christian strive to be rich? Uh, I don't think we have to work hard to not be rich, but should we strive to be rich? And then someone else sent in a question saying something to the effect of, uh, what happens when I have more bills than money at the end of the month? What do I got to do? So we're going to get just kind of chop it up a little bit right here today. Talk about, you know, what does the Bible say about money? Should we actually strive to make money? Um, and we'll talk about that. And then in your discussion times, maybe share some ideas of what has worked for you and maybe be an encouragement to one another. But um, uh, let me let me kind of just help debunk a few taboos. Today I'm not going to be talking about tithes and offering, giving money to church and missions, stuff like that. I'm not going to really go that route. But I will talk about um, what is the heart or what should be the drive of Christians when we do uh, earn money. And uh, should we try to accumulate more? When is enough enough? And uh, I want to debunk uh, two thoughts, if you will, two taboos. And, um, you know, Newton's third law talks about to every action, there's an equal reaction. And um, speaking of how humans, we have a tendency to go from one extreme and push it to the other. And um, in, the, in the early 40s, 1940s, uh, going into the 50s, there was a theology that came from the local church or from church, the kingdom. Uh, speaking of, you know, people of God, righteous people need to be humble and poor. If you have... Uh, an extra suit. If you're a preacher, make sure to give it to the other preacher who doesn't have a suit. And uh, if you have any excess or extra, always give it to others because we should be just slightly above the poverty line. And that became known as the poverty theology, where if you're truly a Christ follower, you should imitate Christ. Uh, there's a passage that says it in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 8, verse 20, I think. It says, foxes have holes or dens, birds, they have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And oftentimes people would use that passage and talk about, you know, we need to le live modestly and humbly and not have extra money. And don't you dare drive a Mercedes because that would be so unbiblical. And, but they take that out of context. That's not what that verse was talking about at all. Just, just to indulge us a little bit here, Jesus was on a mission at this point. He's traveling. He's traveling from town to town. He's not talking about uh, accumulating wealth. That's not the context of what he was saying right here. And, uh, but yet, oftentimes I would hear preachers say, man, you better not have extra money uh, because that is just so ungodly. So that was one mindset that many, many people were influenced by for a long time. Because of that, there was a birth or a reaction to that in the late 70s, early 80s, and uh, it became known as the prosperity gospel or the prosperity theology, where, you know, the verses would be quoted from Deuteronomy 28 saying, uh, you're called to be the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, and, you know, and I can do all things through Christ, and la, 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 and it's like this whole idea about name it and claim it, and this is the confidence that we have that if we ask anything according to God's will, he hears us. And knowing that he hears us, we, we have that which we ask of him. It's almost like people were like wrestling God and telling God what to do for them. And it took it to another extreme. And, and, and it left a very weird taste in people's mouths. And that's why even to this day right now in, in 2016, there are people that are just turned off by TV evangelists and ministries because it seems as though they're constantly pushing for, for more money and different things. So people kind of, particularly the millennials, push away from that because of this extreme view of the gospel of prosperity. But here's a point, though. Does God want you to prosper? W what's the definition of richness or being rich? Is it only financially? God wants to bless us in every area of our lives. That's the, the point. As a good father, he wants us as his children to succeed and to be blessed. It includes good health, great relationships, accomplishments, and achievements. And why not in the area of finances as well? Does God want people to be financially blessed? And the answer is, of course. 
The point, though, the, 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 the idea here in finding balance between living a humble and modest life and living in, in excess or having, quote, unquote, too much prosperity, if there is such a thing, how can we live a balanced life? The big idea here is the question that I pose, and that is this. Who has who in this mix? Do you have money or does money have you? See, because that's the core of the issue right there. When Jesus, you know, talks about, uh, you know, a man's heart is attached to a man's treasure, he's talking about some core values and core issues in people's lives. Who has what here? First Timothy 6.10, uh, it, it talks about the love of money is the beginning of all evil. Or another version says it's the, the, the start of many troubles, the love of money. But let, let me ask you a question. Who here hates not having money? Who here loves having money so that we can do some stuff? <laughs> uh, having money in itself, it, it gives us opportunities to do more things. The love of money in this context has to do with this idea of being driven, where you're consumed with this drive where I got to make more money so I can do more things, so I could have more stuff, so I could have this, and I could have that, and I could go there. And I, If you're driven at, uh, by, by this, this consumeristic drive to, to uh, uh, accumulate more wealth, for yourself, then that is indeed wrong. It's, it's not healthy at all. But does that mean then that we should not strive to work hard to have more resources available to us so that we can do more things? The question is, who has who? Who masters who? There's a credit card, there's Visa, and then there's the MasterCard. Who, who's the master in this relationship here? Do you work for money or does money work for you? you've hung around me for a while, I've talked to many leaders and trained interns. And I like to say like this, first, I don't work for money. I work for the Lord. I actually get paid from our church. Uh, I, I receive a, a decent salary, but I don't work for money. What I do is I actually get the, the money that I receive and I make it work for me. I ask God for wisdom. I ask God for for uh, uh, strategies and insight, and I consult with other people that are financially gifted in, in those arenas. And I say, how can I make this money go further than it should? And I make it work for me, and I work it hard. <laughs> so the idea is, the concept again is, who has who here in this relationship? If money masters you, and Jesus actually talked about this, no person should have two masters. You can't follow God and follow money. It's impossible. Who is the Lord of your life? If money dominates you or if the need or the drive or the ah, tenacity for, for more wealth, if that drives you, then that's not a healthy thing at all. If anything, it's a sin. God should be the Lord of our lives. But the big idea is who has who? Is it okay for Christians to strive to become financially uh, successful and wealthy? I say yeah, absolutely yes. It's, it's actually char uh, characteristic of God. He is an excellent God. He is good at everything he does, and he wants us to emulate him. And he's a God with all the resources, and why not believe that, hey, God is the source of our resources. He wants to bless us so that we, in turn, can be a blessing to others. I absolutely want to be a channel in God's hands. Lord, if you want to send a lot of resources my way, by all means, I'll take it. And, uh, but the idea is who has who here. Um, so God does want to bless people. I actually think of some examples of folks in the scripture uh, that were blessed. And um, even before I go there, I was thinking uh, earlier, what would happen if God blessed you financially and he surprised you? Like, let's say randomly some long lost distant relative died that you didn't even know you were connected to and they left you an inheritance. And all of a sudden it's like, man, you've got a million dollars, which nowadays I guess isn't as much as it used to be 20 years ago. But you got a million dollars that has been left for you. Real quick, think about it right in this group where you're at. What would you do with a million bucks? Think, I mean, what are the first few ideas that, that you would do? Pay off your house, maybe. Buy your mom a house. Buy that cabin up in Lake Tahoe. Maybe some jet skis to go with that. Maybe upgrade your car. I know you just bought it a year and a half ago, but it's like, man, I, now I can afford a brand new car. Pay it off. Maybe set aside some money for your college, your, your kids' college funds or whatever, or Maybe you are in college right now saying, man, I just pay off college in advance. What would you do with that million dollars? Think about all the things, maybe the top five things that you would do. Think about it. Think about it. In your groups right now, go ahead and say it. Say it out loud. What would you do if you had a million dollars? As you're thinking about it, 
let's be honest with ourselves. Most of us would obviously want to try to um, meet our own needs, maybe our family needs right up front, right off the top. It's like, man, I'm going to care for my kids. I'm going to finally pay off a house that would benefit my family, put my kids in a better school, whatever. Oftentimes we think in the context of me, how can mon money serve me? The Bible says that God does not test us beyond what we can bear. Sometimes financial affluency or having more money is actually a test that could actually derail us from success, really. Accumulating money is, in itself is not a success. It's how it's worked that determines whether we will successfully use it or not. Oftentimes we are self-focused and we look to try to meet our own needs first. Jesus said it like this. It actually said, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. So we need the Lord to help us. God, what, what would I do if you blessed me with unexpected finances? Would it corrupt me? Would it consume me? What, what would I do with that? It's a good thought, isn't it? In the Bible, we have examples of how people were blessed. So for instance, in the Old Testament, some of the most uh, affluent people in the Bible were righteous people. Abraham says that he was a very, very rich man. He was very blessed. It's like there came a point where he actually, uh, uh, God used him and allowed him to go and take back uh, resources that had been stolen from other nations. And he comes back with millions of dollars, if you will, in the equivalent currency or treasures of those days. Multimillionaire. That, that was Abraham, the father of our faith, the man that is an example to all Christians of, of how to trust God and to be a man of faith. Um, you have people like Job. Uh, somebody once said that Job was, his name was Job. Um, maybe you should get a job, but his name in this case is Job, pronounced Job. And um, he was a very wealthy man, and he experienced a short season of calamity where he lost everything. Family members, the dude went bankrupt, lost health, all kinds of stuff. But because he honored the Lord, God found, he found favor with God. God turned around and blessed him even more than before. Many people, scholars would, would speculate based on the description of his wealth in scripture that this guy would be in the hundreds of millions of dollars uh, as far as the equivalent treasure uh, in our day today. That's another example. Another example was King Solomon. This is David's son. Man, he inherited the kingdom from his pops, but he was a good man. He, he, he desired of the Lord to have wisdom to lead the people of God. God was so pleased with that heart. He says, man, Solomon, not only were you blessed, but I'm going to bless you. He became the most wealthy man ever recorded in scripture. Bible scholars speculate that based on the description of the treasures that the Bible attributed to him, he would have been a billionaire with a B as in Bob, a billionaire in our culture today, a righteous man. Can Christians or should Christians strive to become wealthy? Why not? Why not? with the intent and the goal of, of course, to saying, God, I want to be hands that you can flow through, pour resources in and through me, not only so that my own needs can be met, but I can meet the needs of others and be a conduit of blessings. So those are examples. Moving it into the New Testament, there's a guy, Nicodemus, he says that he came to meet, meet Jesus at night. Therefore, his nickname is Nick at night because he came to meet with Jesus. He was one of the rulers, one of the leaders in Jerusalem when Jesus was doing uh, his ministry, and he was a very affluent man. Again, Bible scholars say that this is possibly one of the top three, top five richest men uh, in Jesus' day. And he had a heart for Jesus, for Jesus' ministry. Many speculate that in many different arenas, it was this man that God would use to help fund Jesus' ministry. And uh, so here's Nicodemus and uh, connected uh, intricately to the ministry of Jesus. Um, there's also Lydia. If you, if you read in Acts, uh, Paul goes into uh, uh, Philippi and he meets this gal. She's an entrepreneur, a businesswoman. She sells fabrics. She imports and exports. And many believe that she was a very well-to-do businesswoman. Paul himself, the greatest apostle in the New Testament, um, outside of Jesus, the greatest voice in the New Testament, um, is, he was a very educated man, part of the Sanhedrin. Again, the religious leaders, the minds, the, the scholars of his day. Um, he was a very wealthy man, and, and in Philippians it says that um, Paul, and it's a key for all of us, Paul says like this, and I'm paraphrasing, he says, I know what it's like to have a lot of money, and I know what it's like to go with, with very little, but in all things I've learned how to become content. And then he goes on to say, therefore I can do all things who, through Christ who strengthens me. The key that Paul displays for us here is this, learning to be content with whether you have a lot or whether you don't have a whole lot. The point of our pursuit of wanting to perhaps strive for even more financial blessings 
is being content with whatever the Lord has entrusted into our care thus far. So here's the point. God honors hard and diligent work. God honors it. Should we strive to work hard? Absolutely. Keeping all things in balance. What are the greatest treasures? I, I, you know, I think of people that work diligently and think, man, Pastor, I'm working 80, 90 hours to provide for my family so that we can have that house in Lake Tahoe or that cabin up there so we can have some playtime. Is it worth the exchange, bro, where you're working 90 hours a week and you don't get to spend time with your own kids? Is that, is that really rich to you? Um, so there's always a balance. But when it comes to work, though, God honors diligent work. If anything, uh, in, in Genesis, it says that God created Adam and he gave him dominion over all these things of the earth. And God actually created within man's DNA the desire and the, and the calling to work. Work, is, work was embedded into the very DNA of man. We are called to work. Someone once said, no, it was sin that the curse of sin causes them to have to work. No, bro, you're wrong because it says that the curse of sin made work difficult. Now Adam would have to work the ground and there would be thorns and thistles and different things. But the calling of man is to work. So we were called to be diligent in our pursuit. And in the book of Proverbs, the book of wisdom, there's many, many warnings and admonitions about the, the fool who is lazy. Man, a little, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands, taking, taking a big old long nap and ignoring the harvest. When the harvest time comes, you won't be ready. And all these different warnings about people who are lazy. Here's the point. God honors diligent and hard work. We should work hard. We should not look to uh, cut corners, you know, to be cheap, to, you know, to, to uh, you get the point. We should be diligent. So God honors hard and diligent work, and God does not reward the lazy. Amen? Um, uh, God is, uh, here's another principle. God does his super in our natural. As you work and as you're doing your part, then God blesses it and he endorses it. Time and time again, I hear people that are just praying, God, I need provision. I need provision. I've been unemployed for a long time. Have you been job searching? Have you been dropping in some applications? Have you been updating your resume? God won't bless laziness. Hello. But if you're diligent, I believe that God will partner with you. I'm reminded of a, a passage where Jesus comes into town and uh, immediately as he pro approaches this town, the, 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 these workers at the temple said, hey, they, they sent a message through Peter who used to be a fisherman and says, hey, have you guys paid your temple tax already? It's that season. It's due already. And Peter comes back to Jesus and says, man, these guys, man, they're asking us for temple tax. Like you've been like healing all these people, blessing people, feeding thousands of people. And now these guys are asking for the membership fees here. I mean, what's the deal? Should we pay or should not? And there's this exchange. But I, lo I love what it says in, uh, uh, in Matthew 17, verse 27. Uh, uh, Jesus tells Peter, again, a fisherman, not a carpenter, not a tax collector. He's a fisherman. He says, Peter, go down to the lake and throw, throw in a line. Open the mouth of the first fish that you catch, and you will find a large silver coin. Take it and pay the tax for both of us. I've always been amazed at this passage here because why didn't Jesus just go, hey, Peter, check this out. Bop, bop. Woo, where did that come from? Look at that coin right there. Um, he could have just like spoken a silver coin into existence or a whole bag full of coins if he wanted to. He's the son of God. He could do whatever. But he actually did something for Peter that was a blessing to Peter. He says, as you go and you do your natural I'm going to do something supernatural. Had Peter been a carpenter before, he would have said, go build a table and go sell it. Had he, you know, whatever the trade that he came from, Jesus would have done a blessing, but he partnered. Here's the point. We partner with God. We do our part. God does his, his part. Oftentimes we need a, we pray for shortcuts and we ask for God's provision and we're not willing to do our part. Um, that doesn't help anybody. So allow God to help you out. Final thoughts, some practical pointers here. Um, someone says, what happens when you got more money or more bills at the end of the month? Number one, I say this, understand that there's, when it comes to finances, there's only two columns, income and expense. And the goal is you got to have more money than expenses coming in. So if you have more expenses than income, either increase your hours or decrease your expenses. The second thought would be identify your spending habits. What are your needs? What are your wants? And what are luxury items? If I go to the grocery store and I said, man, I'm craving some ice cream. And I go down and I go down the ice cream aisle. And I said, whoo, here's some haagen -Dazs right here. A pint of this chocolate ice cream right here for $12. Um, what category would that be? Is that a need? Some of the ladies right now said that would be a need. A girl needs some ice cream sometimes. I feel you. I get you. Is it a want? 
In this case, haagen it would be a luxury. So you got to think about these things. Are they luxury wants or needs? Consider that and um, develop then a specific budget that works for you, a realistic budget, and be consistent. Stick to it. That's all I have to say for today. I hope you guys were blessed. Um, talk amongst yourselves about what it is to live with a vision for finances. Um, stick to the plan. God's, you know, the Bible says that people without vision perish. A person without a financial plan will fail. So jot it down, mark it down, maybe have someone hold you accountable, stick to the plan, and make the adjustments that you need to make as you honor the Lord. He's going to take care of you. Hey, I hope you guys are blessed. I pray that this time will be fruitful there in your life group. Talk amongst yourselves, be blessed, and we'll see you at church on Sunday. Peace.